Welcome to Why Is This Good, a podcast by the Naples Writers Workshop. I'm Christine and I'm here with John. Hey, John. Hello. All right, John, you picked a story for us. What did you pick? I picked a story by Tadeusz Borowski, who's a Polish writer. And the story is This Way for the Gas, ladies and gentlemen. And this uh, version of it's translated by Barbara Vetter. We lie against the rails in the narrow streaks of shade, breathe unevenly, occasionally exchange a few words in our various tongues, and gaze listlessly at the majestic men in green uniforms, at the green trees, and at the church steeple of a distant village. The transport is coming, someone says. We spring to our feet, all eyes turn in one direction. Around the bend, one after another, the cattle cars begin rolling in. The train backs into the station. A conductor leans out, waves his hand, blows a whistle. The locomotive whistles back with a shrieking noise, puffs. The train rolls slowly alongside the ramp. In the tiny barred windows appear pale, wilted, exhausted human faces, terror-stricken women with tangled hair, unshaven men. They gaze at the station in silence, and then, suddenly, there is a stir inside the cars and a pounding against the wooden boards. Water! Air! Weary, desperate cries. Heads push through the windows, mouths gasp frantically for air. They draw a few breaths, then disappear. Others come in their place, then also disappear. The cries and moans grow louder. A man in a green uniform, covered with more glitter than any of the others, jerks his head impatiently. His lips twist in annoyance. He inhales deeply, then with a rapid gesture, throws his cigarette away and signals to the guard. The guard removes the automatic from his shoulder, aims, sends a series of shots along the train. All is quiet now. Meanwhile, the trucks have arrived, steps are being drawn up, and the Canada men stand ready at their posts by the train doors. The SS officer with the briefcase raises his hand. Whoever takes gold or anything at all besides food will be shot for stealing Reich property. Understand? Verstanden? Jawohl, we answer eagerly. Also los, begin. The bolts crack, the doors fall open. A wave of fresh air rushes inside the train. People, inhumanly crammed, buried under incredible heaps of luggage, suitcases, trunks, packages, crates, bundles of every description. Everything that had been their past and was to start their future. Monstrously squeezed together, they have fainted from the heat, suffocated, crushed one another. Now they push towards the open doors, breathing like fish cast out on the sand. Attention, out and take your luggage with you. Take out everything. Pile all your stuff near the exits. Yes, your coats too. It is summer. March to the left, understand? Sir, what's going to happen to us? They jump from the train onto the gravel, anxious, worn out. Where are you people from? Snosovitz Benjen. Sir, what's going to happen to us? They repeat the question stubbornly, gazing into our tired eyes. I don't know. I don't understand Polish. It is the camp law. People going to their death must be deceived to the very end. This is the only permissible form of charity. The heat is tremendous. The sun hangs directly over our heads. The white hot sky quivers. The air vibrates. Rates. An occasional breeze feels like a sizzling blast from a furnace. Our lips are parched. The mouth fills with a salty taste of blood. The body is weak and heavy from lying in the sun. Water. A huge, multicolored wave of people loaded down with luggage pours from the train like a blind, mad river, trying to find a new bed. But before they have a chance to recover, before they can draw a breath of fresh air and look at the sky, bundles are snatched from their hands, coats ripped off their backs, their purses and umbrellas taken away. But please, sir, it's for the sun. I cannot. Verboten. One of us barks through clenched teeth. There is an SS man standing behind your back, calm, efficient, watchful. Meine Herrschaften, this way, ladies and gentlemen. Try not to throw your things around, please. Show some goodwill, he says courteously, his restless hands playing with the slender whip. Of course, of course, they answer as they pass, and now they walk alongside the train somewhat more cheerfully. A woman reaches down quickly to pick up her handbag. The whip flies, the woman screams, stumbles, and falls under the feet of the surging crowd. Behind her, a child cries in a thin little voice, Mamala! A very small girl with tangled black curls. The heaps grow, suitcases, bundles, blankets, coats, handbags that open as they fall, spilling coins, gold, watches, mountains of bread pile up at the exits. Heaps of marmalade, jams, masses of meat, sausages, sugar spills on the gravel. Trucks loaded with people start up with a deafening roar and drive off amidst the wailing and screaming of the women separated from their children and the stupefied silence of the men left behind. They are the ones who had been ordered to step to the right. The healthy and the young who will go to the camp. In the end, they too will not escape death, but first they must work. 
Trucks leave and return without interruption, as on a monstrous conveyor belt. A Red Cross van drives back and forth, back and forth, incessantly. It transports the gas that will kill these people. The enormous cross on the hood, red as blood, seems to dissolve in the sun. The Canada men at the trucks cannot stop for a single moment, even to catch their breath. They shove the people up the steps, pack them tightly, 60 per truck, more or less. Nearby stands a young, clean-shaven gentleman, an SS officer with a notebook in his hand. Hand. For each departing truck, he enters a mark. Sixteen gone means one thousand people, more or less. The gentleman is calm, precise. No truck can leave without a signal from him or a mark in his notebook. Ordnung muss sein. The marks swell into thousands, the thousands into whole transports, which afterwards we shall simply call from Salonika, from Strasbourg, from Rotterdam. This one will be called Sosnowitz Bedzin. The new prisoners from Sosnowitz Benzin will receive serial numbers 131-2, a thousand of course, although afterwards we shall simply say 1312 for short. The transports swell into weeks, months, years. When the war is over, they will count up the marks in their notebooks, all four and a half million of them. The bloodiest battle of the war, the greatest victory of the strong united Germany, Ein Reich, Ein Volk, Ein Führer, and four crematoria. That's enough. That was a section. So had you read this before and where'd you find it or what made you pick it? I had never read this before. I follow uh, Auschwitz Memorial on Twitter. A while ago, they shared like it was the anniversary of uh, the author's birth. They use like anniversaries, like births and deaths and stuff as memorial, as days of memorial to like remember the victims, right? And they post like a photograph and a little thing about each of them just to try to remember, right? Sure. And so it was his, some anniversary of his, maybe his birthday. And um, I'd never heard of him. And I was like, wow, what did he write like what short stories did he write because he wrote like a little volume of short stories and then apparently like a few years later a few years after the war just killed himself uh, i don't think he could handle what he had gone through and having written these and now read uh, the story you know you can see the position he had within the camp so i think he had a lot of guilt anyway so i read this that about him and i looked into his stories and i was like yeah i think i want to bring this one so this is somewhat autobiographical or is it yeah i think so i think that he basically puts himself into I mean it's not strictly everything is his experience but I think it's mostly drawn from his own experience in the camp okay. at Auschwitz I mean I usually assume that with a lot of these stories because there's especially this kind of thing yeah yeah there's like certain details and things where I don't know that you would I don't even know that you would want to try to get away with envisioning it you know yeah you want to fake it yeah it just seems wrong to fake it yeah so what'd you like about it I guess as horrible as it is <laughs> <laughs> What'd you like about it, John? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, this is just such a great, I don't know, great. It's such a vivid depiction of what happened. And a lot of the commentary around like his writing is that he just presents it starkly. There's not a lot of commentary. There's not a lot of, um, you know, these things were all horrible. And what I did was horrible. It's just you just watch what happened according to the depiction. And then you make the moral judgments yourself is how it's often described. And I, I just thought, you know, that's such a good... One of those things that fiction can do really well is just present things without commentary, without real, like, here's the moral you should derive from this, especially when things are obvious like this. Yeah, it is, like you said, plainly stated what's happening. And I wonder, not to like slam his writing or anything, I mean, it is it is wonderful, but I wonder how terrible something that you're describing or how like visceral or, you know, powerful the emotion is. I wonder how, how strong that has to be for your writing to be plain you know and straightforward for it to like kind of come across you could see in in the story how they kind of have to separate themselves from what's happening right yeah right i'm sure there's a lot of that like trying to like like he has a breakdown in this story yeah. and you know sometimes character emotions can stand in for like an editorial statement so the characters are themselves wrestling with the situation, like the narrator and the Frenchman are, are often having a conversation about what's going on. It's like, I can't handle it anymore. It's like, you just have to deal, you know, like that sort of thing. And that can stand in for like that editorial statement that would sum up like, what did we just read? Right. We talked to though a lot about how anytime we've read a story that's about war, or even if you introduce like a dragon or something, there's like all <laughs> these things that the reader is subconsciously doing to kind of fill in the blanks for the writer, you know? Yeah. Because they're so familiar with a lot of these 
settings and things. So I don't, I <laughs> did not fight in World War II, but you tell me it is World War II and I'm filling in the blanks. So I wonder too how much of it is, because, you know, I'm, I start reading this, I'm like, oh shit, this is a story about a concentration camp and this is a guy that's being forced to do these things. So I'm like automatically filling in a lot of the emotional stuff that you're talking about. And not that it doesn't come across. It's just, yeah. I feel I feel so primed for these stories that when I read this one, like I was trying to think afterwards, what will I remember from this one specifically? Because I just feel like there's so many things that I've read like this that are all so horrible and they're all so well done in the sense that they're writerly or graphic somehow, or they're doing this thing where the writing mimics this character's survival technique of removing himself and that's powerful. So I think with something like this, because this one does very much feel like a little vignette almost. It's like a slice of like a day or something over the course of a day. It's one day, isn't it? Horrifying. Yeah. Yeah, it's one day of all these trains coming in and like the things that he's remembering specifically from each one. And there's definitely scenes in here where if you were to try to jog my memory in a couple months, you'd say like, yeah, the one where like the beautiful blonde girl gets off the train and she's like gorgeous. And then she's, you know, just kind of like, where are we going? And, you know, she's curious and totally out of the blue and then gets like slapped by the officer. It just goes like flying. Stuff like that, like might be the stuff that like particularly sticks out, you know? I don't know what I'm trying to say with all of this, except that uh, there's just like certain stories where I just file them away in a category of horrific shit. And it's it's hard. Th- this one, too, the, the what's unique about it is like we, we mentioned the perspective of this guy that's having to do this and he doesn't want to do it. And uh, he's coming to terms with what he's going to be having to do if he wants to live a little longer. And his buddy is has been at it a little longer than he has. And it's trying to give him like advice. He's like, yeah, if you want to steal shoes, you can steal shoes. Uh, I don't know, man. It was rough. And I also feel like a terrible person when I read this shit and I'm entertained by it on a certain level. Like I'm engrossed by it, you know? Oh, yeah. Like, cause this was a long story and it didn't feel long. Yeah. Even though each each train that came in was the same situation, it was depicted yeah. differently. Like different specific moments happened in each of them. So it was like a new thing. So you weren't like just repeating things. When I printed mine out, it wasn't double spaced, but it came to 15 pages. Ages. Which, yeah, that, that weird internet formatting where it's like single space paragraphs with like a little break in between. That's what it was. So, I mean, like for what we read, that's like a solid story, you know? Yeah, that's a pretty, that's a decent length story. Yeah. And yeah, like you said, there it was a similar kind of pattern, right? I mean, trains are literally arriving and the same thing happens every time they unload these passengers and like lie to them and things. But like there were new little uh, maybe realities that like we're becoming privy to, right? Where he's like, well, what would you tell them? He's like, when I see someone I know, I'm, I tell them that they're going to get a bath and then I'm going to meet them in the camp a little later, you know? There, there's little like turns like that. Yeah, I I mentioned that, you know, sometimes the character conversations can stand in for like the editorial kind of commentary. They kind of can raise the questions that the story, like explicitly raise the questions the story is asking in a way. Right. There's a one that's like, he asked, listen, Henri, are we good people? That's stupid. Why do you ask? You see, my friend, you see, I don't know why, but I'm furious, simply furious with these people, furious because I must be here because of them. I feel no pity. I am not sorry they're going to the gas chain. Damn them all. I could throw myself at them, beat them with my fists. It must be pathological. I just can't understand. Ah, on the contrary, it is natural, predictable, calculated. The ramp exhausts you. You rebel. And the easiest way to relieve your hate is to turn against someone weaker. Why, I'd even call it healthy. It's simple logic. Compris? Like, we can totally disagree with each of those positions. Like, oh, I I can't imagine feeling that way. And how is that a real answer? And also acknowledge that that's likely how the character felt, how the person that he's depicting might have felt. And then that opens up that, like, uh, space for... um, kind of moral inquiry that yeah. just a good story opens up usually. So you were saying something about characters like asking these questions and like that gives us the entry into um, kind of thinking about our own reaction to what's being depicted, right? Right. It's not just the horrible things that are happening around him. It's how he's reacting to it. Oh, yeah. I mean, having like fresh horror compared to his friend, you know? Yeah. And the whole situation with what they call the Canada section, the Canada men, where they get all this food and he describes Henri as fat once in a while. Yeah. There was a, James Clavell wrote a book called King Rat. And it was about like a, a, a British prisoners of war under Japanese. They've been captured by the Japanese during World War II. And um, in the, the camp, 
they were most all of them were starving but this one guy became like this like scrounger and he uh he would procure stuff and sell it to the prisoners and like there was a whole economy he worked on he was they called him king rat so but at the end of the book he's always described as like you know fatter than the rest of the prisoners and then when the rescuers came and they like liberated the camp all these like actually healthy british soldiers are standing around and uh they look gigantic next to the prisoners but then there's the one slightly fatter prisoner and everyone kind of looks at like what's up with you so this sounded to me like the canada men were that guy in the yeah. concentration in auschwitz you know they got fed better they got to scrounge all the scraps and like he's eating tomatoes they got the marmalade you know like so they're presenting like that's his situation and he's like it is obviously horrible but it's also so much better than what these other like the jewish prisoners are going through being just some of the descriptions of even the Jewish prisoners in the barracks are like uh, horrendous, you know, what they're going through. Right. But these particular ones are better off. Anyway, just seeing like that disparity is also raising those questions. And that's why he asks himself, how do you, how do you deal with this? Right. Yeah, I did underline that section that you read where he's asking his friend, like, are we good people? But the friend has that kind of like perfect response that probably like is a metaphor for the rest of this whole story, right? Like they're doing to these prisoners what the Nazis are doing to everyone underneath them. I mean, on some level, everyone is doing something that like probably makes them feel horrible, but they're justifying it in a lot of different ways. And then one of the feelings, like a lot of it being survival. And then one of the feelings that has to come up is that you end up actually hating these other people you know yeah not because you actually hate them but because like he says like they're the reason that they're there having to do this in the first place and because they're you know every train that comes in he hates these people because they're about to make him do something terrible right like he doesn't he hates having to do it he doesn't want to do it yeah they seem to be the proximate cause of his suffering even though you know yeah. it's not them <laughs> yeah i mean in his little world like the powers that are actually pulling the strings are so far removed from him physically right yeah Everyone's just a function in a machine. Yeah. Terrible, terrible machine. That was probably like for me, like the strongest feeling throughout this story that was, like I said, kind of like unique to this story, maybe for me at least, compared to some of the other stuff that I've read about these kinds of concentration camps and things. And I think it's interesting in in a situation like this to be able to even articulate it. That seems like something that you would uh, have to come to terms with like years later. Like a therapist would have to drag out of you the fact that you felt this way about these prisoners. I mean, the author wound up committing suicide a few years later yeah so he it sounds like he was like going through it i don't know yeah like maybe someone else would have successfully buried it and never addressed it right and he's like he's like feeling it as it's happening and then of course after i'm gonna change gears <laughs> It's difficult with translated works to really comment on prose level oh, stuff. Yeah. And, you know, I did want to talk about that. Yeah. But I thought that, you know, and who, I don't know, I don't read Polish. This isn't the original Polish version, but usually translators try to do a good job of maintaining like the tone and like the feeling of things. And I don't think you would add or subtract much from what I'm about to talk about in a translation. But the section I read, one of the reasons I picked it was because the way he writes this litany of details you know, yeah. just the um, comma separated lists, you know, even punctuated like short sentence lists. It's detail. It's um, impression, impression, impression. It's like this thing, then this next thing, and then this next thing over and over again. And like you get to an end of one of those and there's a little like kind of in between section and then another list right. and another list. And it was really effective as far as creating the scene and creating just the overwhelming feeling of everything, like how much of it there is. Right. I do wonder with translated works, I don't know enough about that work to know how often you're having to make certain decisions that like greatly affect uh, the end product, you know? Oh, translating? Yeah. Yeah. Because I know that there's an art to it. Yeah. And like, you know, how often in a, in fiction versus like a technical manual, you know, you're probably coming across like turns of phrase that just can't be captured in other languages. And then it like really truly does affect the overall story so sometimes i think about like what's lost to me in this translation but i can't know yeah i have to go learn polish well enough to read good fiction in polish yeah, and yeah. honestly that's like pretty low on my priorities right now <laughs> <laughs> on there but it's yeah it's pretty low i mean and then this story has mixed in actual german phrases yeah and some french too 
trying to think what a takeaway for me would be for a story like this, because these are the kinds of stories that I hope I'm never able to write first off, right? I don't want to ever experience something so horrible that it goes down in history and then there's fiction written about it. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. I don't even want to like have to worry about that. Maybe I could write about my, <laughs> being in eighth grade when I heard about the World Trade Center. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I just like, who cares from my perspective? Well, those things like the world, the what happened to you the day the Trade Center, if you're like, you know, I was in uh, Florida at the time. So it wasn't like immediately impactful. You were what in in Ohio at the time. So it wasn't like you're standing at the feet of the buildings, right? Looking up at them. And so everybody has a story like that. It's the same thing with the pandemic. It's global. Everybody yes. has a story of what happened at that right. time. So it's, it's hard to add to that. <laughs> you know? I don't, yeah, and I don't want to. I mean, like I, it's not my place to obviously. Yeah. So I, I can't even, I don't even have, there's nothing about this that I could hope to mimic or would want to mimic or even like coach someone to like somehow capture in terms of the content right and the fact that it is we assume like it's pretty straight autobiographical or like you know maybe if this wasn't a particular day it was autobiographical in the sense of his overall experience right yeah and i wonder too what his aim would have been you know because on the one hand you might argue that i don't know that he was trying to be an artist or if he was just trying to get get it out you know yeah he would sound like he was tortured by it so maybe he's just trying to get it down yeah so i guess like the only thing i would say in terms of it being like a takeaway is that maybe if there's something like horrible that you feel you're experiencing personally personally and it's never going to make it in a history book well, we always talk about this kind of jokingly that fiction workshops are not supposed to be like therapy sessions you know that's right because a lot of times people will bring something in and they think that the sheer content is what makes it worthwhile in terms of me wanting to read it like oh i went through a horrible breakup or my mom died yes it's like no offense that happens to everyone most people experience those two things at some point and yours might be really raw and rich for you but it's also the reason why autobiographies are so um, few and far between on like the average person. You got to be Anne Frank, you know, her diary would not have mattered if it wasn't this massive historical event. We wouldn't have plucked hers out of obscurity if she was just writing about a crush. It mattered in the context of everything, right? And then of course, like, you know, she's able to capture certain things and she becomes a voice from that moment. But when it's me, <laughs> like writing about something that made me sad yesterday, like nobody cares nobody really should so my takeaway though is that i do think even if it's not going to rise like as the cream of the crop for some greater context if it's like powerful for you like i hope that this writer experienced some kind of relief like articulating it you know yeah and they examining it and if that's like what you're feeling what you're preoccupied by whatever it is like maybe it never sees the light of day and you never bring it to a workshop or if you do you're at least like ready to take feedback that doesn't care about your feelings you know because it isn't a therapy session it's about whether or not I enjoyed reading about your horrors but I still think there's something like obviously really valuable in, in trying to write that down not as a therapy practice and not as a journal exercise but writing it in a way where you hope that whoever reads it could understand you right so there's like merit in writing some of these therapeutic things if it's in an effort for the reader to understand you and that's fiction i think yeah that's like what i love about a lot of fiction is when i'm reading something and i've talked about jane eyre before like i have no business identifying with anyone in that book but there's like certain things where she would say stuff and 14 year old me was underlining it like yeah you're so right and it's identifying those common feelings or being able to understand where some coming from because they've articulated it with written word you know that's what fiction is supposed to be is speaking to the human experience like it uses yeah. specific concrete details to speak about generalized human experience like the emotion of being human the feeling the experience of being human and so when you read fiction you're participating in that you're like oh this is an, another person's story even if it's made up this is a human story that i can take in yeah so like i said i don't know that he was trying to get published or make money off this kind of stuff i get the feeling that you write about this kind of thing because you can't even think about anything else right and then You're compelled yeah and then you obviously do it maybe he does it in a way where he hopes that the reader understands what he or the other characters in his life were actually feeling and going through right you're not just like documenting it i guess is the point you're not exploring your own feelings for the sake of exploring your own feelings you're hoping for something for the reader and i think that's what's like that's what i think probably gets a lot of like angsty kids into fiction in the first place 
right? Because there's a fine line, I think, between journaling. There's people that I know that have journaled their whole life, but they don't write fiction. And some people will tell those people, you have a book there. And I think to myself, please don't bring it to my workshop because I don't know that you've written it in a way that is for the reader. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. Like a breakup can feel like the end of the world yes. when you're in it, especially when you're young, right? Yes. So writing that as a story where you show that emotion to the reader, that's how you make that into, it's not just, you know, you know that the emotion is and you put some details down in a book to remind right. yourself of them. That's different. You have to get that feeling into the words. Right. I've done like light editing on people's autobiographies and I won't do that again, but <laughs> it took me a long time to realize that that was a lot of the difference was that these are people that were trying to get down their own experience and they thought that people would really want to read it. And it's like, yes, your family will want to read this because they want to absorb the facts and you're the only one that knows them. But just like a Wikipedia article can't make me cry, like this is not fiction. This is not for the reader. And, and autobiographies obviously are not fiction, but there's nothing like about that narrative that like I'm interested in usually. I think that leads to my takeaway, which um, I could have said something about the the prose, you know, the, the list thing and the litany and the kind of way to make details. But my takeaway was more about the characters. Like what you're talking about with like capturing something that making it into fiction is obviously he was wrestling with questions that came from the situation. And he put those questions into the voices of his characters and had them talk about him. And that's one way that fiction can, you know, make those circles around emotions and try to figure them out is to get characters to talk about it. They don't have to be like perfectly articulate because, you know, they're characters. They're not philosophers yeah. and unless you're depicting philosophers, I guess. But who knows if that actually happened in the camp where like he yeah. and his friends right. talked about what was happening. They just endured it. It right. might have because people talk about these things in the moment. But even if it didn't, writing it as if it did, as if those questions were forefront in their minds and they were trying to figure them out in real time. Yeah. That's how you make this bigger than just mere description of what's happening. You make the characters wrestle with it, you know, because yeah. that's the question that you're wrestling with as the writer. If you're writing a, a story about a breakup, like what is right. your main question about that or right. some life event? What is your, your, what is the thing that is making you struggle with it? What does that question look like? Right. And if you were to have that conversation, how would that conversation look on the page? And I think that's where moral drama comes from because you're wrestling with moral questions. And that's where like even lesser kinds of drama between characters, because each character might have a different answer to the question. And then right. that's conflict, right? So anyway, that's, that would be my takeaway from this is like how to get those questions into the voices of your characters. It's not everywhere in here either. It's like no, yeah. a couple of times you just kind of touch on it. It's enough to raise the question and kind of like put this umbrella over the whole depiction. Yeah. And uh, that light touch, like I said, I don't know that it's necessarily something that you can achieve with every story, because I do think I'm doing a lot of the a lot of the work of like filling in the blanks of what these people experienced and what they likely felt, because I've just consumed so much about this experience overall. You can raise the question without answering it, too. That puts it yes. on the reader to like, yeah. try to like, what would I think? Right. But I do think that there's something to be said for a light touch overall coming across as like uh, very literary, <laughs> like... So you might be like asking too much of your reader to fill in the blanks of, you know, what the overall takeaway is. But when you have that light touch and you haven't like beat a dead horse, then it does come across as kind of like provocative versus like, I don't know. I think that's um, that's how you make it fiction. Like I said, they're, these aren't philosophers. They're not going to have the yeah, answer, right? right? Right. They're just human beings wrestling with a problem. So if you just allow them to wrestle with a the problem, they're not going to figure it out. They don't have to figure it out. That kind of ambigu ambiguity is is kind of a lot of the best fiction has that ambiguity. Yeah, right. Yeah. Ambiguity, not in terms of plot, but like like raising a question. Answers. <laughs> yeah. yeah. People always want answers. But I mean, I mean, this isn't a story. No, ambiguity about answers. That's the key, I think. But but I would also, I guess, maybe suggest that there are certain questions so large that they don't have the answer and so you know like don't even try <laughs> like yeah your little story is not going to fix like 3,000 years of history and how even... <laughs> yeah there's certain things where you shouldn't even attempt it and uh if you did I'd read it and say this is corny or something you know what I mean like and that's probably partly why I hate feel good stories because I, do, I don't think that there's neat little bows for a lot of the horrible things that people are compelled to write about not that they're all holocaust level but even just like the emotional like shit that people 
people go through. You don't want an answer when you're reading it. You just want to feel what that person's feeling. It's the same way like, you know, when someone starts complaining to you about something, you're supposed to say, do you want a solution or you just want me to listen? You know, like, I just want you to read this story. I don't want you to try to like solve anything with it. I just want you to like come along with me for a minute and experience what this is like. So yeah, a light touch is nice. That's a great point because, you know, what is fiction about? It's about characters. It's about human beings doing human things. And part of that is the struggle to answer questions. It's not about finding answers. It's about struggling to find answers. And maybe there are no answers to certain questions. All right. Thanks, guys. If you enjoyed this episode, consider joining our Patreon. Your support helps us keep the show running. Find out more at patreon.com slash why is this good podcast. And for industry news, writing tips, and great short fiction, join our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash Naples Writers Workshop. You can also subscribe to our monthly newsletter at napleswritersworkshop.com.